Okay, uh, a warm welcome to all the University School of Business. We're actually on campus today. We even have some people here in the audience. And we're here today uh, to talk about how we could better together build a more socially sustainable working life. This will be a series of talks where we will be talking to different experts that comment from their different perspectives. And our very first guest is with me here today, uh, Hilka Olkinwara. Um, and it's very difficult to know where to start with describing or introducing you. You have done so many things and your list of your CV is so long. But for this, I have asked you and you've okayed it. So I'm going to call you um, a business uh, journalist, a management advisor and a reverend. That's cool. And you'll be commenting from those perspectives, but your entire perspective, I guess. So a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you for, for starting this series with us. And um, the first question is not a small one. Um, we'll start with the big picture immediately. So I'd like you to comment from your perspective, like what do you think we should be focusing on? What do you think we should be doing in terms of building a more socially sustainable future of work? Where do we start? What's central? Actually, uh, I take the big picture to myself and start with a story. Okay, A personal Super. story uh, that explains why I'm here. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was one morning, I was brushing my teeth, looking at myself in the mirror, preparing myself for my uh, working day. I was at the top of my career. I was editor-in-chief in the largest uh, business daily in Scandinavia. And uh, the work day, then and there, all of a sudden looked like a labyrinth. And I was one of the rats running there. And we have all, all been sent there mm -hmm. as rats to bite the tails of each other. Mm -hmm. Because that was the culture of the working place mm -hmm. then. Highly competitive, highly immoral. And I was watching the com uh, day that, that was waiting for me. And I realized that if I go back there, I won't be able to see myself, look myself in the eyes when I'm old. And then and there, I understood I have to leave. And that is the core of a sustainable uh, use of human capital, human resources. Mm -hmm. We need respect mm -hmm. for each other. And that's the beginning of sustainability. And I'm also hearing self-respectful organizational working culture. Indeed. And individual respect for each other and also the type of organization where you have a possibility to display that. Yeah. And you stay to change. If you can't change, you leave. If you can. It's a quest question of life and death. I, I couldn't stay asking. I yeah. just had to leave. Yeah. Okay. That's not a small answer. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a life and death, a question of like um, going for res towards respect. And I fully agree. I think that's something that we also see in all of our data. This like particularly between generations, there is like a, there's a change. There's a, some kind of a shift on the go where people are more focused on thinking about what should their life look like. This idea that work is your life is particularly with younger generations. This is a huge generalization, and I'm sure there are exceptions, but seems to be sort of more and more the, the upcoming trend. And this is something that COVID has definitely deepened. We see in our colleagues' data coming from the US, coming from, from Finland, coming from world over, that the link between people and organizations has loosened. Mm -hmm. This life yeah. and work have somehow Let's say that if before work was very central, and work is central, it's a big institution that forms part of your identity and connects you to society. But now when you look at this, this data coming in and, and, and talk to people in organizations, you hear that suddenly life seems to weigh more. And COVID has, has had an impact on this. I Have you witnessed this as well? Yeah, I think that uh, COVID has been a great equalizer between ages. And it's no longer uh, a choice uh, or, or, or thoughts about life and work. It's, uh, it's, um, uh, it's a question of, again, life and death. Mm -hmm. Think about America. One American out of 500 has died in COVID. Mm -hmm. So that reminds me of another trend like uh, 
20 years ago, when people around 40 uh, started looking for new jobs mm -hmm. to be able to do something meaningful. Mm -hmm. And the Americans, they joke, of course, for the serious things. The Americans call 40 years old people like being over the hill. Mm -hmm. And it's been quite a long while when you, when you start figuring half of my life is gone, what I do with, with the rest of it. Mm -hmm. And COVID has sharpened that point of view. Yeah. And I think that people now, they no longer ask like they do in the shampoo ad, uh, because I'm worth it. People ask, is this worth my children? Mm -hmm. Is this worth my planet? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so it's too. It's a change. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm thinking here that that what psychologists, for instance, are witnessing, also coming from neurologists, people are reacting in different ways. We all suffer from some kind of lowered levels of resilience, meaning that sort of everyday stresses that maybe before didn't feel so bad, now they you feel them a lot with lowered resilience. Mm -hmm. And in general, this stems from the fact that what Corona has shown us is maybe something that you have worked with longer than that most of us, i.e. that we can't control life, mm -hmm. that in the end of life there's death, no reward in terms of mm -hmm. <laughs> the best employee of the month. And I guess this is something now Corona really has reminded us. Yeah, of. the death rate for everybody is 100%. So. Yeah, and but we just don't remember that or we mm -hmm. don't like to think about that. Mm -hmm. but, but now we we've been to. forced to. Yeah. Sure. And that is changing the way we look at working life as well. So what do you think we should be do, doing then, going back to working life? What should we do about working life? And I'm now thinking from the perspective of respect, life and death. I would say for everybody, especially for the, for the youngsters, that now since you have been, you have been panning for gold, mm -hmm. and I do hope that you have found nuggets in these two years of Mordor. So keep the nuggets, make something out of them, out of the gold you have found. And then I'd say to, to everybody in organizations, I'd, I'd say two things. Uh, one of them would be respect each other's fears. Uh, there's been so much sorrow about the years that we have lost, the life we have lost, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the festivities we have lost. Mm -hmm. And we are, as you say, we have confronted fear. So let us take that seriously. Let's not force anything on each other. Let's not be braver than we can be. Mm -hmm. But then the other thing, uh, uh, especially managers now have a great uh, chance of surfing on this uncertainty. Mm -hmm. People have been shook up, truly, really. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we can also use the uncertainty to, um, to achieve something. I especially recommend a documentary made by Minna Duftan that's called Small versus, Big versus Small. Mm -hmm. And there, uh, literally, a surfer uh, faces her um, fears vis-a-vis. Mm -hmm. -vis the, 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 the big waves. So that's something we can do now. We can face the waves, surf on our fears, yeah. instead of being drowned in them. But what if you feel like you didn't find any nuggets? What if you just feel Not tired and brain fogged and kind of lost and kind of like thinking about these thoughts that, yeah, I don't, I don't know if this is what I want to use my life doing this but what what else you know what if you feel lost i know this is a big question but what would you Quite say then a few of us feel lost and then i i just recommend to to get together discuss this openly mm -hmm. and uh, expect the um uh, treatment is expect the the um atmosphere yeah in the working place, in yeah. the studying place, that gives room to these doubts. To keep, even instead of like trying to pretend that now everything is as it was yeah. when we all left, understanding this that we're actually coming back to a completely different life and, and taking it up. And maybe you can just grab a little nugget from somebody else yeah. and share it. Yeah.
Yeah, and I think that this is actually this is very interesting because if we look at our data pre-corona, we see that the sort of already the the change that was taking place in the working life, new technologies mm -hmm. that evoke that evokes a lot of emotion in people. If you put in Google Scholar, you write emotions and new technology, you get so much research that yeah. a couple of months is not enough. And I'm not talking the whole scale of feelings and so much emotions. fear don't you? and fear, so fear is one yeah. of them and yeah. this pro yeah. uh, this um, imposter syndrome this idea that everyone else understands these complex technologies everyone else can use everything automatically it's just me who feels like I don't know what I'm doing and I think this was already present and now we're talking fear on top of fear mm, yeah and this in a human being is in organizations not a very good thing is it uh, no, I think uh, if I would be allowed to make the new Ten Commandments, mm -hmm. so the first commandment absolutely would be, thou shalt not fear. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that is even in, from the perspective of organization, like you, you know that what happens when you're afraid, you stop hearing properly. Mm -hmm. You don't hear what other people are saying, you only focus on this, whatever your core of your fear is thinking is so I'm guessing that with, without having any direct data on this now that for instance communications in organization gets a bit more complex so from that perspective it would be very good idea to somehow get together and discuss at least this this uh, situation that has happened to all of us discussing your separate fears in terms of different technologies can be harder but like talk at least talking about this would probably be a good idea and the fear of any individual, any human being, any dog, any cow, would be uh, to be, uh, not to be irreplaceable. Mm -hmm. uh, we have let each other feel for quite a long time that if I don't have you, I have somebody else. And that's a horrible thing to do mm -hmm. to a human being, yeah. to a feeling and thinking. That being. you can always be replaced. Yeah. yeah. It, it doesn't matter that it's you, it could be somebody else. Yeah. And, and when you live in this kind of atmosphere, you, you can't breathe, mm. but you have to perform. You yeah. have to perform 24-7, 110%, not to be replaced by, mm -hmm. and then we come to the robots and the AE, yeah. uh, that uh, AI, that um, uh, you are no longer safe no. in your being. Yeah. And uh, the COVID has done its part. Yeah. So, so that's something I'm I'm really worried about, because uh, also uh, a scared person uh, is is um, uh, very hard to to um, handle or mm -hmm. very hard to communicate with. Mm -hmm. You never know how it will she will react. Mm -hmm. So it makes uh, all all the uh, beautiful ideas of, of sustainability and uh, and leadership uh, void. Yeah, and I'm thinking that already before um, we were looking at basically what we know from our data that uh, the the role of the immediate mid manager, mm -hmm. your team leader, your your immediate supervisor, is more important than ever before. This yeah. was already the case before. COVID came. Yeah. Now COVID has accelerated this. So I'm now asking you a very difficult question, but what would you do as a middle manager? What's now good management? If we, if we kind of take it for granted that we're more or less looking at a heterogen, more and more heterogeneous organization where people are experiencing this fear in different degrees and in different ways. Some of us are more open about it. Some of us like to play heroes. And now you're giving advice to a middle manager in an organization. How do you? How are you a good manager in the middle of this double, triple fear? Fear for your life and well, death. Fear of technology. Fear of uh, everyone's going to find out that I don't know as much as I do. Well, I don't. I don't envy anyone being a middle manager because there you are. You do the job. No. You sweat. And all the time you hear that actually organizations are supposed to be very lean. Uh, middle managers actually shouldn't be there at all. Yeah. But there you are doing your job. And what I think that middle managers uh, need, well, management needs, mm. is more communication. 
Mm -hmm. Think about uh, Volkswagen that got caught mm. with uh, with uh, with a scandal. Yeah. Think about Nokia that got caught with a near bankruptcy. Yeah. In both cases, the middle managers uh, were afraid of telling upwards mm -hmm. what's happening, mm -hmm. and and um, the whole organization collapses. Mm -hmm. So here we come back to the to the um, to the fears. You have to be safe. You have to be brave enough to uh, share the reality. Mm -hmm. And the middle managers have a unique position of seeing up and down. Mm -hmm. So they should be encouraged to to communicate, mm -hmm. which they today are not really. No. no. And then when you think about uh, the the well, the Hmong fa many faceted um, work life now with many different ethnic, cultural, mm. religious, religious uh, groups. So I think that uh, everybody should just throw away the word word tolerance. Mm -hmm. Let's not tolerate each other, because to me, tolerating is that I'm sitting here. And I'm letting you be yourself as long as you don't disturb me. Mm -hmm. Instead, yeah, I'm kind of like, as long as you kind of stay as, as far away from me as possible. Don't rub my circles, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I think that uh, to embrace the many various cultures, mm -hmm. feeding, uh, well, profit, feeding joy, mm. feeding productivity. So we should, instead of tolerating or uh, cultural managing, we should see each other and we should uh, uh, respect each other, rejoice, mm -hmm. rejoice in each other's cultures and work very, very much more than today against all sort of segregation. Starting for housing mm -hmm. up to, uh, well, genus, segregation yeah all segregations bad why why do we why do we need to segregate so much um, well there are two things uh, we should realize we work with one of them is ethics and one of them is moral mm -hmm. and they are not the same thing ethics is about what is good and morals is what is right and most people agree on Ethics. Mm -hmm. It's like the Ten Commandments. We mm -hmm. all want, we want a good life. We want a family. That's ethics. But then, the family, it can have like three wives and twenty children. How would we uh, then relate to that? Mm -hmm. So we should understand that we all the time we work on uh, two roads, two levels. And, and we should be, we must be, we should, we must be able to communicate between this uh, large abstract human thing mm -hmm. and the practicalities of work life. Mm -hmm. And if we manage to do that, we uh, have gone a long way, baby. <laughs> I was going to say that this, we're listing things that we must be able to do. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> when I'm thinking to um, a situation where I'm, for example, training a group full of leaders, managers, I was this weekend, and you tell them that you need to start thinking about your thinking, you tell them that you need to start taking emotions that work into better considerations mm -hmm. because they are very much a fact. This, today like we've discussed here because of COVID because of changing nature of work and then you get this blank stare and someone's like well you know how pushed I am with my schedule already okay. when do you expect me to do that then I generally say that well if you look at all the leaders in the world who have been awarded rewarded seen as the best leaders they all take their time mm -hmm. to think but is there anything else one can do yeah. to be more aware, I guess not. If we just push on without much consideration for what's going on, we're not likely to have time to consider our ethics and our morals. You have to make these considerations a part of your uh, breathing, your life, 
yeah. your blood circulation. They all have to come naturally. And I think this is now where we are facing a huge challenge because we've been operating in a different kind of ethos when it comes to working life for so many years now. Mm -hmm. And now we see growingly that this, this what the way work is changing really demands this kind of rethink. And so much uh, I can say to encourage you is that as long as I have been holding the hands of, of, uh, of the great businessmen or the organizational gurus uh, in, in, this, uh, in, in Europe, so in six times out of five, the discussions have creeped, uh, crept into uh, the values I personally embrace the frustration when I cannot uh, communicate my values mm -hmm. in practice or to other people. This is now so in the management advisor. So the values have advisor. been there all the time. We yeah. just have to let them uh, come out. So you're saying that these top, top managers that you've been advising, that what they want to talk about is their inability Sooner, to live their values. Yeah, yeah. The frustration. This is what I want. This is what I think. Uh, this is not, not what I know is right, mm -hmm. but see, I can't make it happen. Mm -hmm. How do you believe, become a change master? And here, uh, when you mentioned this um, imposter syndrome, so let us remember that the first study in this was uh, yeah. a psychological study of uh, Fortune 500 bosses. Yeah. And the thing that, was, uh, w that they shared was this uh, feeling of fear that they are found out. Yeah. Sooner or later, I'll be found out I'm not as good as I pretend to be. I am an imposter. So uh, th if this is something we share on the high level, so why can't we share it on all levels? It's and, human. Yeah, and shouldn't we now take this opportunity to take this crisis and somehow unpack this imposter syndrome that we all seem to share in one way or another, yeah, coming from the top management. We know from, for instance, HR research that everything that comes from the top management trickles down to the whole organization. So maybe it's not such a wonder that organizations are filled with people who have an imposter syndrome if the leaders are going around thinking, oh my God, I'm an imposter. They're yeah. going to find out that I have no vision. I, they're going to find out that I made up the vision this morning. <laughs> And I didn't come I out think, right. I think that um, when we originally talked about this talk, mm -hmm. um, we had a great title or, or like a theme for it in Finnish that we then translated and then we both agreed that the translation wasn't maybe that great. But It the, wasn't so poetic. It no. wasn't so, it didn't rhyme. Yeah. Because in Finnish we said arvot, arviointi, arvostus, or you said. Sure. And then in English we said, we translated uh, values, appraisal, appreciation. Yeah. But if we go back to that, because to, then that came up in conversation because you thought that these are the three key words mm -hmm. for the new socially sustainable future work. Mm -hmm. to, to, to sort of, <laughs> to be modest, <laughs> that's how it's going to be. Yeah. And, and can we, we now talk about this? Cause I, I think we've talked about this now in a way already. We've talked about values and morals and ethics, and we've talked about um, now we talked about appreciation and tolerant, tolerance versus appreciation. How do we create appreciation on a societal level? If we think about this uh, society that we're living in, we, we, we have large groups of people that are going to lose their work. Mm -hmm. And researchers are not worried about people losing their basic income because we can all, we, they're, they're more or less in agreement regardless of their party politics that there needs to be some kind of citizen salary. That's the mm -hmm. only way mm -hmm. forward. Money is not the problem here. The biggest problem is where do we get identity and purpose for mm -hmm. these people? So how do we, how do we create a, a going away from this idea that you are your work? Mm -hmm. You're only mm -hmm. going to be mm -hmm. worth mm -hmm. of something if you work your ass off. <laughs> So how do we show appreciation? How do we... Well, when you say uh, that you would need a feeling of appreciation, mm -hmm. uh, that's not enough. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't need a feeling, you need an experience mm -hmm. of appreciation. Yes. 
And that's something very concrete. Mm -hmm. That can be small things yeah. at the workplace, that can be big things, that can be outside work. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you have to know that you are worth something in other people's eyes mm -hmm. and in other people's lives, mm -hmm. that, that, that you are needed, mm -hmm. quite simply. And uh, to be able to share this, well, imposter feeling or, or this uh, experience of not being worth anything, mm -hmm. you, too bad, you have to... Uh, well, show yourself as yeah. you are. Yeah. And as you know, in the Finnish sauna bath, you can, uh, you can be naked because you feel safe. Mm -hmm. And uh, in uh, the corporate life, you can be naked if you feel, if you are safe. Yeah. And here we come to the question of shame that mm -hmm. we, we uh, sort of touched yeah. previously. Uh, when uh, I was a minister taking confession, mm -hmm. so I, 30 years ago already, so I talked to my mentor about the problem that a person can come to confession, tell me her sins, mm -hmm. get absolution, and go away. Mm -hmm. But every now and then it didn't work. Why? Mm -hmm. It wasn't guilt, it wasn't sin, it was shame. Uh, guilt is something uh, uh, that you do. That you, you feel guilty when you, you've done you, something you, you wrong. You realize that you are doing something wrong. Yeah. You can make it good. You can say, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. and you can go further mm -hmm. and, and leave it behind you. Mm -hmm. uh, but shame is something that uh, is not what you do. It's what you what you are, mm -hmm. and the community makes you feel ashamed. Mm -hmm. you, you are no good to us, and whatever yeah. you do, we don't take you back. Mm -hmm. And especially when you think of social media today, mm. so you are sitting in the stocks quite quickly. Yeah, uh, and coming out of shame mm. is almost impossible. And the thing. Mm -hmm. That interests me is that uh, from the so so to speak healthy guilt culture, mm -hmm. we have moved. We we have been moving to 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 the shame culture, the culture where honor mm -hmm. is 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 more important than anything else. Yeah, and honor is very often what it looks like. Mm -hmm. So we should. I would like to see us go back to the guilt uh, uh, guilt culture. Mm -hmm. uh, where, uh, where the concrete uh, problems can be solved together, mm -hmm. where there is risk taking mm. and forgiving, mm -hmm. because there's no risk taking without safety, no, no risk taking without forgiving, no. and 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 forget this uh, this uh, honor mm -hmm. we are so eagerly trying yeah. to reach. I guess that's something that sort of um, that is visible also in that technology and new new technologies and emotions um, mm -hmm. emotions this kind of idea that you it, it's it's a shameful thing to admit that you need to always be the one who knows everything yeah and the type of culture that you're yeah. creating around work with this new tools coming in and everyone going around that yeah yeah i know what that is yeah, yeah i know what to do with that yeah, yeah i can use this because uh, rather than saying that well what is this but then when you go and talk to people about this and you for instance say that when you interview top leaders they say in a research interview that thank god i have teenagers at home because i can ask them what yeah. to do with this and that's ridiculous that you have a working culture where you would have to keep this kind of front instead of saying that can we now together discuss what we do with this and how we do this and mm -hmm. and what's going on but there is a lot lot of that around technologies um, and something that technology researchers usually throw back at us is that that why do you have so little critique mm -hmm. about these technologies that why are you just taking them in and going like mm -hmm. okay great we'll yeah. start using this and that I guess this is uh, has this is somehow links to this idea of and shame and and honor and this kind of like 
I cannot put it possibly say that I don't know what to do with this. Whereas if we were more in the guilt culture that you're talking about, you'd be like, I'm guilty of not knowing what to do with this. Yeah, so what? Yeah. yeah. And in this, uh, well, uh, culture of ours, very often this technological shame is uh, um, attached to another kind of shame we have. That mm -hmm. is the shame of getting old. Yeah. The elderly yes. don't uh, know how to use the, the ICT. So they are doubly shamed yes. because uh, they remind us, us of uh, not only death, but also the, the problems we all face before. We yeah, die. and this is very much a generational issue. But then at the same time, we see also this kind of um, what comes up is that assumption that because you're young and you play a lot and you use your smart equipment a lot, then you absolutely automatically know what to do with every program. But and this is something that then also comes up at work that, you know, you, you, you should stop assuming that anyone knows anything or doesn't, that rather let, go with the question. Let us not forget that uh, anything we, we do and handle, it changes, but the human person, yes. human predicament, it does not change. No. If it would change, we would not be... Uh, watching Shakespeare, no, we would not be reading Sappho. Mm -hmm. The 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 human, uh, well, the human life, humanity, mm. still is what it's always been, and mm -hmm. that's something that we should not forget. No, but I think that when it comes to organizations and the changing work and now COVID, this maybe is one of the big frictions that there is this very stable, unchanged human mm -hmm. and then a lot of spiraling change around mm -hmm. and the question is how, how do we mm -hmm. how do we become a shame free organization how do we stop feeling shame at work if we start with an individual it's an easier answer you don't have to solve the whole whole organization okay. here for us but say, let's say if someone's watching this and thinking that okay well i feel ashamed every day at work or mm -hmm. i feel i feel like I, can, I feel like an imposter so what to do yeah, how to face the reality. Yeah. Uh, I don't give much advice to my kids, but there is one thing I, I always wanted to say to them, and it is that you can make anything, anything happen in this world, mm -hmm. but uh, with on two terms. One of them is never try alone. Always have somebody, a couple of people, to, to, to accompany you. Yeah. And then the other is that don't care about the honor. Don't, yeah. uh, don't care about who gets the credits. Yeah. Focus on what you want to accomplish. And if you want to like, uh, grow out of your shame, mm -hmm. so you need people you can trust. And I think that that's not only a personal thing, no. because there are shaming organizations. Yeah. It's also a leadership question. Yes, very much. To be aware that, that uh, we are not ashamed of making the mistakes that make Nokia yeah. and, uh, and uh, Volkswagen collapse. Mm. It was shame. Yeah. The silence. Silence. That shame creates. Yeah. So that's, I guess, if, an organize, if you're thinking about how to create a shame-free organization, you need to think about the silences mm -hmm. that you're creating. Mm -hmm. This is, I'd like to continue on that, but I, I'm, aware, I'm aware of the fact that we need to keep a certain schedule here as well. I, I, this is actually now continuing from this, uh, this discussion directly. You use a phrase, you get what you measure. Can I tell a short story? Yes, you can. Yeah. Uh, I work with, uh, mo I, I work mostly with uh, things that are very hard to measure. Mm -hmm. So I've, Such I've as given that some, like, well, uh, your, the, the, uh, the state of your soul. Okay. Like that. That's a small thing to work <laughs> with. Everybody take a minute to consider that people work with the state of your soul. Yeah. Yes. But I do, I do also work with measurable things. Mm -hmm. And I was once working in a tiny community having like uh, six uh, healthcare centers. Mm -hmm. And they decided to let one center double or triple the doctor's times. 
So instead time of they a, spend with yeah, instead of a quarter, so you could talk to your doctor like almost an hour. Okay. Wow. What happened? an hour? Yeah. What happened? People got healthy. They didn't die. They got healthy because they could concentrate. I mean, they could communicate. Mm-hmm. So they got healthy. And they could probably also look at the person more as a holistic whole. Indeed. Rather than focusing Indeed. on the one. Yeah. Yeah. So I just go in symptom by symptom. Yeah. So uh, people got healthy, but what happened? I mean, what happened was that they couldn't continue this. They had to go back to the 15-minute schedule. Oh, this was because, just a test. Because oh. yeah, because the financing is uh, was allowed by the amount of patients. Ah, of course. Or, or the amount of, of, of visits. Mm-hmm. So if you get one person to go to a doctor four times, mm-hmm. you get more money than if you get the person to the doctor one time. Oh, great. <laughs> the four times he didn't get healthy. Yeah. With the one time he did. Mm-hmm. But that's not what was measured. No. So this was, for me, a, a very uh, good reminder of yeah. that you get exactly what you decide to measure. Which is then probably the nice thing to park in the back of your head if you're in, in, in the power position of making decisions, for instance, over performance reviews. Yes? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so not always in the sort of healthcare sector, but in any place. In like any whatever place. you're mm-hmm. measuring, that's what you're actually enticing in people. Yeah, it steers yeah. your activities yeah. to that. I, I, I like that example a lot. Can I, can I steal it? Can I start using it? In, you can start I, using I, it. I always but I, tell I, stories I in the tell, class. <laughs> I won't tell you I, where. I can, qu- I can quote you on that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have only a few more questions yeah. left, but um, there's, they're big ones. I think that this, we all are aware, very aware of this life-wide learning. It's something that we all hopefully are already considering. Mm-hmm. Um, we should be considering it as something that that happens rather organically that I'm now thinking what I can learn from you and what I can learn from the audience and what I can learn from my day rather than thinking about it just as something that you you take a degree or you know you have to that learning we need to rethink learning as well Mm -hmm. but you are a living example of life-wide learning you've been doing this long before anybody talked about is you Mm -hmm. have how many occupations five (laughs) you want to reflect a little bit on that like why and how well here the words that we have been like uh, using here mm. come to mind mm. like uh, uh, safety uh, versus uh, being scared risk taking uh, and uh, and also not caring about the credits and i think that uh, to, to anybody who comes to me and, and want to discuss a new job, a, a new uh, occupation, uh, I would recommend uh, looking for a red thread. Mm-hmm. So that if you are an art director mm-hmm. and all of a sudden bec- uh, want to grow buffaloes in Colorado, mm-hmm. So that might not be all that good idea mm-hmm. if you don't find uh, what is the uh, what the new path mm. will uh, cater for in your mind mm. and in your in state of your soul. In uh, and usually, when I see uh, lucky um, travelers mm. on this lifelong learning path. Mm you see a red thread uh, every now and then through you see, their th- yeah, different things yeah, that they've yeah, done they, it's 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 like uh, on on a trapeze you you take hold of that one and then again that one mm. that there is something strangely similar and something delightful and new can i ask what the, if you had to give a name to your red thread what would that be actually it could be uh, an answer to your last question, really? which I know okay. what it would be. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, I'm asking my last question yeah. then. Um, well, this is uh, the question that I will ask from everyone who comes here. 
And that is a, a final piece of advice. Okay. Uh, what to focus on now that we're thinking ahead and we're, we're hopefully all very dedicated into building this better, more socially sustainable future of work. And now we need that badly. We need mm. it badly. And we also know that we, for it to happen, we need to work simultaneously on individual, organizational and societal levels. So what are we, what's your piece of advice? What do we do on individual, organizational, societal levels simultaneously to get there? Actually, I refuse to have these different levels. Oh, good. Because they By are... By all means. <laughs> they are all part of the same whole... Uh, yeah. yeah, same life. Yeah, and I would add individual, organization, society, and I would add planet. Planet, okay. planet too. Yeah, and uh, actually, the answer to my personal life, the answer to humanity, mm -hmm. if one may say so, yeah. is the same word. Too bad it's um, it's um, best in Swedish. Okay. But you can say it in Swedish, it, and in, then we... It, yeah, we try to translate it. It's uh, perundras. In English, it means that we need to cultivate our ability to be filled with wonder. Constant and state of astonishment. Constant state of thankful, respectful astonishment. Out with fear, in with joy. Okay. That's a tall order, at the same time a delightful task. And I think that we can now send everybody away to think about what's the state of your soul <laughs> and how to be sort of, in, if you like, inviting joy in and throwing shame out mm -hmm. of the window. And using that kind of thinking in the, and when you're thinking about your work. Never stop wondering. I might, I'm still going to have to ask this, that, but, but, and I know that you have maybe said this in a couple of interviews that I've read, but sometimes this can feel very hard if you're in a very difficult situation, for instance. So what do you say then? To, to sort of find the joy. If you're really sort of ridden with shame and you're really feeling like you've lost something, where do you find the state of a constant joyful state of astonishment? I was not talking about constant state of joy. No, no. That would be Hollywood. Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, and this is uh, being uh, studied, yeah. I mean supported by studies, the best way of getting rid of shame is to laugh, not to be laughed at, mm -hmm. but to be able to laugh with somebody. Mm -hmm. And uh, the joy doesn't have to be gargantuan. Yes. If you let yourself be uh, wondered, surprised by life mm -hmm. in all its shades, mm -hmm good as and the bad mm -hmm. i think that you you come out of the uh, dark mm -hmm. the shame if you start and, and this is like like parallel type of thinking that that we see more or less necessary in all aspects of working life that you kind of need to start unpacking the way we've done it and rethinking and finding the sort of what are the things that we should keep in the present working life? What are the things that we should throw away? What are we, in, in terms of the sort of understanding the emotions better, taking them in mm -hmm. and then in, and looking at them as sort of valid parts of our working life? And I think what's really interesting here in this conversation, for instance, is that in certain working cultures, even 10 years ago, this would have been considered co complete gobbledygook. Yeah, yeah. Like, why would you, ooh, why are yeah. they talking about the state Beautiful. of someone's soul or shame? Or, and now we know that going further and further, this is, these are the central things. These are the things that machines won't know how to do for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. And the better we are with them, the better we are in managing our emotions or whatever terrible thirds of phrase you want to use about this, the better we will be in, in sort of feeling better at work. 
feeling better at ourselves. And I think that that these, I love this kind of idea that you start looking at learning as something that you try to learn from other people. You start looking at life as something that, yes, okay, this happened. Can I see something good in that? Can I somehow try to turn it around? Rather than seeing it as a fixed state or mm-hmm. a condition. Mm-hmm which is what I guess what you're kind of saying here, that it, yeah, Mm -hmm. it it flows, it comes and it goes. And if you really want a recipe. I do, I'm trying to force you. Just a recipe. (laughs) I know they don't exist, but I'm I'm pushing you. You go to Spotify, you find my uh, childhood uh, idol, Mm -hmm. uh, Jerry and the Pacemakers, Mm -hmm. and you turn on, you never walk alone. Okay. That's the recipe. (laughs) Music, music is a good recipe. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Hilka. Thank you for this conversation. It's been really nice. Thank you, everyone.